Uh, well, good morning again. Uh, it is wonderful to see you here. Uh, it's always nice to be asked to come and preach somewhere that you haven't been for a while. That's always a bit of a compliment. It's even better when they ask you to come back uh, and they know what they're in for. Um, so please join me as we pray and have a look at Psalm 40 together. Please pray with me. Gracious Father, as we have a look at this ancient text and we hear the words of David, we pray that we could enter into his experience, that we could learn to see you the way that he sees you, that you could become our great God and we could become your faithful, loving people. And we pray this for the sake of Christ. Amen. Well, broadly speaking, the world is, of course, divided into two groups of people. I was reminded of this when I was at the beach yesterday. Uh, There's the first group. There's those who have tattoos. uh, And there's the second group, those who hate tattoos. There really does seem to be one or the other. It's one of those topics that's very rarely neutral. Uh, There's a guy at my church who's just got a tattoo. He was quite proud of it. He was showing me last week at Bible study. uh, And he's got this picture of a lion on his bicep. It really looks quite good. And he was telling me, you should get one, David. And I looked at the size of his bicep and I looked at mine and I thought, there's no way I'm going to fit a lion there. Like, (laughs) at best, there's going to be a cheater on my arm, you know, something a little thinner. But then I got thinking, I thought, well, what if I started with the cheater, but then over time... As things sort of started sagging and gravity went in, it would go from looking like this noble cat to kind of like this just drowned little rat or something like that. I'd just wait for the day when people would look at my arm and go, you know what, that thing will never run again. Like, (laughs) its days are over. Now, look, I mention tattoos because my brother, he's one of the have tattoos people, uh, and the tattoos that he have is actually Hebrew script. He's got Hebrew words on his body. So on one of the sides... Uh, just around here, he has the word Bane, which means son. And on the other side of his body, he's got the Hebrew word for family. So I think it's a bit of a reminder to him. You know, I do have kids uh, and I've got to care for my family. And, you know, again, I'm a bit of a wuss. I'm not sure I could really get a tattoo. But if I was to get a tattoo and if I was to follow my brother's lead and I was going to get some Hebrew script on my body, uh, looking on the overhead there before you, that's just a little bit of an outline. That's where we're headed today. But I put the Hebrew up there. If I was to get any script on my body, that would be it. Uh, And hopefully what we're going to do today is I'm going to help you not only learn how to pronounce those Hebrew words, but enter into them. If I do my job properly, by the end of today, you will love this expression and understand it fully. And it's basically this, uh, Yigdol Yahweh. That's the Hebrew expression. Yigdol Yahweh, it's the highlight of Psalm 40. So just have a quick go at that, Yigdol Yahweh. Say to the person next to you. Next time I'm here, I'm hoping just to hear that in conversation. You're just breaking that in as you chat to one another, Yigdol Yahweh. And again, by the end of today, that's our aim, to be able to say Yigdol Yahweh, which means something like great is the Lord or the Lord is exalted or the Lord is magnified or honoured. It's a phrase that doesn't occur very often in the Psalms, but whenever it does, it's always in the context of God's saving activity. So it does mean great is the Lord, but in context, what it particularly means is great is the Lord towards me. And to be able to say that and mean it is one of the great aims of the people of God. To actually be able to break into conversation. How are you today? Well, I'm Yigdal Yahweh. Great is the Lord. God is great towards me. And it could be he's great towards me because I'm having a wonderful week and things are working really well and I'm just loving life. But a lot of the time, as we're going to see in this psalm, the challenge of Yigdal Yahweh is to know that God is great and he's personally great towards you when life isn't so good and it isn't so enjoyable and, in fact, it's really, really hard. And that's where we're headed today, to be able to see how we can know that God is great and he is great towards us even when we're struggling. Now, to do that, please have your Bibles open. We will be going through Psalm 40 together, and it begins like this. Psalm 40, verse 1. For the director of music of David, a psalm. 
Now, of course, one of the things that's confusing when you start reading the Psalms for yourself is not all of the Psalms are part of the original. So if, as I look at Psalm 40 before me, I've got a heading in my Bible, Thanksgiving and Cry for Help. That's a wonderful summary of the Psalm, but of course, that's not part of the original. That's part of the translator's notes. And in that sense, it can be a little bit unhelpful. And the reason it can be a little bit unhelpful is it can just make the context of the Psalms a little bit more difficult to see. And what I mean by that is go back and have a look at the very first Psalm, if you can. Go back and look at Psalm uh, Psalm 1. And what you'll see is that, well, it just jumps straight into the Psalm. Again, you've probably got some sort of heading there in the English Uh, But in terms of the the Hebrew, the original, it just jumps straight in. There's no of David or anything like that. And the very first word in the whole book of Psalms is actually just the word happy. Now, most uh, English translations will use the word blessed, but it's a Hebrew word for happy. It's a fairly rare word. It's the first word in Psalm 1, and it's almost the last word in Psalm 2. Psalm 1, how happy is the man who does not walk uh, in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners. The Psalms are an invitation to the happy life. And then Psalm 2 ends like this. Pay homage to the son or he will be angry and you will perish in your rebellion for his anger can ignite in a moment. Happy are all those who take refuge in him. So the quest of happiness is put before you at the beginning of Psalm 1, the end of Psalm 2. And at the end of Psalm 2, happiness is linked to the Son, which is biblical speech for king. Whenever you read the title, the Son of God in the Bible, it's not talking about God the Son. Language gets a bit confusing. Son of God is always a person. Son of man is divine, but we can talk about that later. Son of God is really just a heads up. It's a shorthand way of talking about a king. And so we meet a son, a son, rather, in Psalm 2. We meet a king, a king who is your pathway to happiness. Then we get to Psalm 3 and we finally get a heading in the Hebrew or in the original. And Psalm 3 begins like this, a psalm of David. And here we meet our king. Here we meet the one that's going to take you to the happy life. But listen to his life. A psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Lord, how many are my foes? They increase. There are many who attack me, many who say about me, there is no help from him. There is no help in God. One of the great questions of the books of Psalm, there are five books in the Psalm, and we're about to come to the end of the first book. The first book is Psalms 1 to 41. One of the great questions, of course, is... How on earth can David, whose life is just characterized by suffering, how on earth can he help us become happy in God? David was the great king, but he was the great suffering king. That's how we're introduced to him. He's the one whose sons, whose family members were trying to kill him and whose people were rejecting him. How is it that he is our pathway to happiness? Well, we get the answer, I think, to that at the end of book one, uh, and we're almost there in Psalm 40, and initially it begins like this in verse one. It begins with patience. Psalm 40, verse one, I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, poetry, it's hard to translate everything, and waiting patiently for the Lord, that's a really good translation of what's going on. But in the Hebrew, it's been a little bit clever Perhaps a better way of translating verse 1, and it doesn't really work, which is why no one does it this way, but it would almost be to end that little phrase with an exclamation mark. Because grammatically what David has done here is he's put a mode of intensity into what he's talking about here. So he's not waiting patiently. He's waiting patiently. Some sort of exclamation mark. And that's kind of hard, really, to figure out what waiting patiently, but with lots of energy, looks like. And so if you're struggling to picture that, just think any kid Christmas morning. You know, when the kids are sitting around and there's a presence under the tree and they're waiting, and they might even be waiting patiently. 
They might be resisting the urge to get in there under the tree and rip them open, and they've been playing those games all week. I don't know if your kids do that, where they kind of walk past the tree. They know they can't touch the presents, so they kind of stamp and they kind of hope a couple of the presents fall over and they can then read a few more of the labels, you know, which one's mine, is it the big one, is it the small... They're waiting, but they're not waiting in inactivity. They're kind of really doing everything that they can so that they can sit still. David is is waiting, but it's taking all of his energy. This is an intense waiting for the Lord. And why is he waiting intensely for God? Well, he's waiting intensely for God because he's stuck. And he's stuck in what he describes as a, a slimy or a desolate pit of mud and mire. And again, it's tough to translate everything, but the word desolate or slimy, depending on which way your translation is gone, it, it carries with it the, the meaning of things when they just bash into one another with velocity. This word slimy or desolate, it's the word that you use to describe big rocks in an avalanche as they just smash into something at the bottom. Or those waves on the beach, you know, when the surf is really up and you can hear it crashing onto the shore. It's just loud. And David is waiting with all his energy for God. Why is he waiting? Well, because he's in a a pit or a cistern, or a well, literally just a hole in the ground. But this hole in the ground that is his experience is a hole that is yelling at him. It's, it's roaring at him. His life experience is such that he describes it as being stuck in a hole that is overwhelming all of his senses. But not only is this hole in the ground loud and roaring and scary and threatening, it's consuming. He's stuck in a hole that is full of mud and slime and it's slippery and it's boggy and it's swallowing him. I grew up in a little country town called Dineloquin. Great place to live, although it's just butt ugly. Like the town, it's dead flat, it's semi-arid and it has a river running through it. But we call it the coffee river because that's exactly what colour it is. It's the sort of river that when you swim in it, you actually can't see your arms. I remember freaking out when I first swam in the ocean because I could see these things coming to get me and then I realised just my hands. But you, you swim in the Edward and you can't see your hand when it's there. It's so dark. But the trick to our river is don't spend too long on the edge. Because if you get on a slow bend in the river where all the silt has just built up over time, it's just boggy and it's sticky and it clings to you. And as my son found out, if you wear your sister's thongs into the river, once you tread in that slime, they're just gone. They're just sucked off your foot and taken who knows where. But that's David's description of his life. He's in a hole that he can't get out of. He's stuck and it's swallowing him and the noise is overwhelming. And he is waiting patiently because it's taking all of his effort to do nothing. Have you felt like that? Where the roar in your head will not stop. And where you are putting so much energy into life but you can see nothing that you've achieved. You're just trying to survive that's David he is waiting patiently for the Lord he is stuck he is overwhelmed and the mire and the noise and the filth is around him and it's dragging him down and then then it happens God lifts him up in such a profound way that he can now talk about his experience as having his feet set on the rock. He has a firm place to stand. And his whole worldview, if I can put it like that, is now different. He's not in a hole where there's nothing to see. He's up there on the rock. He's perusing it all. His feet aren't getting bogged down beneath him. He's on a firm rock. He can move forward. He can progress. And you can see that as David's experience now changes, his whole outlook on life changes. And it changes in a way that invites you to enter into it. 
If you have a quick look at the outline there, you'll notice the way that I keep going from the personal to the public, the personal to the public. And that's what this psalm does. David's experience, I waited patiently for the Lord. He brought me out of the muddy pit. What's happening to David then becomes the common experience of the people of God. He's going through these things so that we can benefit from them. How do we find happiness through the suffering of David's life? Well, we start to get an answer to that in verse 3 and following. God put his feet on a rock and then he's put a new song in his mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And of course, what do songs do? They invite you to join in. Uh, One of my sons before he left home just loved singing and the place of course he loved singing the most was in the shower I don't know what it is about shower and singing but you knew when he was having a good day because when he was in the shower he just sang and when he didn't have a great day he wasn't singing but he would just sing and sing and sing and the mood was so infectious that even me a dad stopped complaining about how much hot water he was wasting and how much that's costing me, which every dad should do, by the way. And I just was sort of caught up in the joy of that moment. Singing invites you in. And, of course, that's what David does where at the transition phase where he's talking about his experience and now he's going to invite us to join this new song. And biblically speaking, a new song is not a song you've just written. It's not new words, It's a song that's new for you. They're old words, but they're words that you're now able to join into because you've been forgiven and redeemed by God. And so if you read the book of Revelation, the destiny of all of God's people is to have this experience, to be delivered by God and sing a new song, a song that's new for us as we enjoy ultimate and ongoing deliverance from God. And so David, with his new song on his mouth, he then starts talking about, well, almost giving a public principle from his life. Verse 4, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. No longer just talking about himself, but drawing others in. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And here finally is our happy word. We haven't seen it since Psalm 2. David, though he knows what it's like to suffer, though he knows what it's like to have his family turn on him, though he knows what it's like to be in the pit, happy, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Now, why are you happy if you trust in the Lord? Well, David goes on to explain, no one can compare with you, Lord. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. You can always be happy as a follower of Jesus because God's saving work is always ongoing. He has done miraculous things. He is doing wonderful things and none can compare with you. And as David generalizes that principle that as we concentrate on the saving acts of God and the way that it affects us, He then almost rededicates himself to the Lord. Verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. It's a little bit odd, that reference to the ears in the middle there, isn't it? Sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but offerings and sin offerings you did not require. David's talking about the way that Well, once you know God, doing what's required is just not enough. But how did David get to that point when he realised that? Well, in verse 6, I think he's talking about the pit experience again. What happened when he was in the pit? Well, life was roaring at him and overwhelming. But what has God done? Well, it's almost like God has got the shovel and got all the muck out of his ears and he's unblocked them so now that David can hear And now that he can hear, he can remember what God is like. Don Carson makes the point when you're going through really tough times, it almost is like you're in a pit and your horizon just shrinks. When you're going through something really tough, when work is really just overwhelming or maybe there's uncertainty or when you've got a relationship that is just really painful or you're going through some sort of illness, your horizon shrinks, doesn't it? 
It's like you're in a hole and there's only that one bit of light above you and that's all you can see is the tough stuff that you're going through. What does God do when life is like that? He broadens our horizons. He helps us see. He helps us look around. And as we see and look around, what do we see? We see the people around us. And even when we're going through the pit ourselves, as our horizons are broadened and we can see more than just a hole above us, but we can now look around and we see the people of God, we can look at the way that they testify to his goodness and we can enter into their stories of God's goodness. And David here just overflows with this self-dedication. He wants to do more than what God requires because, verse 8, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is written on my heart. I'm not really a boss in my workplace. There's not all that many people I'm in charge of. But if I was a boss and I wanted to get the most out of my workers, I reckon the best way to manipulate them wouldn't be just through paying them their salary. I mean, if you don't do that, that's going to be a problem. But I reckon as a boss, if you really want to manipulate people, you just throw in a few extra things... You know, so you might just give them the Christmas party at the end of the year or you give them those few extra nice things so that in response they go above and beyond where they don't just do what they're paid to do but they do that little bit more. Because people who are happy or grateful, they just want to give extra, don't they? And in one sense, this is David. As he looks around and his horizons have been broadened and as he sees the wonderful things that God has done for others and is doing for him, his heart is motivated towards God and he rededicates himself to God. And, of course, that person experience then becomes public again and he makes it almost a public principle that this is what we keep doing. As we keep living life before God, we keep rededicating ourselves to him and serving him. Verse 9, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. David's life was a life of suffering. And yet, through David's suffering, we see God rescue him. And through David being rescued by God, we all have something to thank God for as he cared for and saved his king. And David's suffering was there so that we can look at this king, be saved by this king, and join in the joy of this king. He suffered for his people, if I can put it like that. And, of course, we know what that's like because we have David's greater king, don't we? Jesus is there to bring you happiness. But how did he do that? Particularly when you look at his life, when he just suffered over and over again to the point that he was crucified on the cross. How does Jesus give you happiness? Well, he doesn't give you happiness in the sense that he gives you a wonderful Christmas present that just brings joy to your face every day. He brings you happiness by showing you his love, that he suffered for you so that you could be delivered, rescued from the pit, redeemed and transformed. And of course, this is a message that the author of the psalm, David himself, is going to need to remember as much as what he went through was for the sake of the people. It's also for his own sake, as verses 11 and following almost take us back to the beginning of the psalm. And David needs to remind himself of how good God was because it's almost like he's suffering all over again. Verse 11. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. In verses 1 to 3, we concentrated on almost the emotions of what it was like for David to suffer. But now we get to see what that suffering actually was. What was it that led to that pit experience for David? Verse 12. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me. And I cannot see. When I think about David's life and I think about the things that he went through, I think about the way that Saul was trying to kill him. I think about the way that his kids were trying to kill him. I think about the way that he suffered as a leader. But notice what David goes to first. What for him was the pit experience, the first thing that he articulates? Sin. For David, the more he knows the goodness of God the more he knows the godlessness of himself. And it's overwhelming. Have you got to that point as a follower of Jesus where you've been overwhelmed by your sin? 
Because if you haven't, you're either not paying attention or it'll come. You will get to that point when you realize the only thing that is ever going to stop you deliberately disobeying Jesus is when he comes back again. You'll get to that moment where when you look at yourself accurately in the mirror, you don't like what you see. And you know you can't change. You can keep progressing, you can keep fixing up bits and pieces, but you will be you. And it can be overwhelming. And so David prays, do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord, for my sins, they surround me, they roar at me, they suck me down and squeeze the life of me out of me and I cannot see. Verse 12, he continues, my sins, they're more than the hairs in my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. How was David lifted out of the pit? He was forgiven by God. And as he remembers that he was forgiven by God, he's almost emboldened to keep asking God for more help. Verse 14, may all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. What's your go-to reaction when you're threatened by people? I do have an automatic prayer response, but it's generally not when people are having a go at me. My automatic sort of go-to prayer response kicks in whenever my kids drive a car. That's just <laughs> prayer. My daughter's an L-plater at the moment, lots of prayer. My kids are away at the moment, lots of prayer. Not so much this one for me, though. When I'm attacked, what's my go-to move? It's very rarely prayer. It's usually defense. It's usually defending myself or attacking them. But what was David's go-to? Prayer. When he was attacked, he ran to God. And he ran to God for help in such a way in verse 17, he can describe himself like this. But as for me, I am poor and needy. How is the king poor and needy? Well, again, I don't think he's saying that he doesn't have resources. Again, I think he's just speaking almost emotionally. He doesn't feel like he has what he needs. He can't pull himself out of that pit experience. He is vulnerable. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. That's why I think David was able to declare, Yigdal Yahweh, great is the Lord towards me. Verse 16, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. The Lord is great towards me, Yigdal Yahweh. The confession of the people of God is that God saves, that he rescues, and that he is good. Not just good in and of himself, but good towards you. Great towards you, our deliverer. Deliverer from trouble, but more importantly, our deliverer from sin. And it's this psalm, Psalm 40, that the author of Hebrews picks up on to describe Jesus, our great king, who does lift us up out of the pit, who does forgive our sins. In Hebrews we read, by this will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Like David's suffering encouraged his people, Jesus' suffering is for our good. It is our access to the happy life, the life of knowing that we are always loved by God, always redeemed and forgiven by God, and have a great future with God. But of course, the way church works is we don't just benefit by looking at Jesus we actually benefit by looking at one another that was the benefit of the people of God they got to look at David see through David's experience the goodness of God and it's like that for us when we come to church that's the example of the apostle Paul who told us to follow him as he follows Jesus he told us to look at him and his sufferings and be encouraged in the way that God was with him. 
In Philippians, Paul says this, Most of the brothers in the Lord have gained confidence through my imprisonment and have dared even more to speak the message fearlessly. And in this I rejoice, there's our happy word. Yes, and I will rejoice, not because I'm loving life in the fact that it's fun, but because I know that this will lead to my deliverance through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but now, as in always, with all boldness, Christ will be highly honoured in my body, whether by life or by death. Friends, how are you going to keep declaring, Yigdal Yahweh, great is the Lord? We do, of course, have our great King Jesus that we can keep looking to, but the encouragement I want to keep with you this morning is actually to look at one another. Make it one of your aims when you come to church or hopefully a Bible study group if you go to something like that to actually be part of the larger people of God who declare the praises of God. Now, how does that work? It works by you being real enough with the people around you and known enough by the people around you that there's always someone in the room who can declare the greatness of God. The group I work for, we're a Christian group, so we're always forced to pray together. We're put in these groups. Uh, and it's been wonderful to be part of a prayer group for years now, almost decades, because we get to look back together over the times in our life when we were stuck in the pit and we celebrate the way that God has lifted us out. Or even the Bible study group that I'm a part of. Last week, we actually didn't have a Bible study. We had an end-of-term dinner. And one of the ladies, Jade, from my Bible study group, came up and told us about the way that although her grandfather had passed away and we'd been praying for him for a while, he became a follower of Jesus right before he did. And it was just that wonderful Yigdal Yahweh moment where although other people in our Bible study group, some of them have got chronic, ongoing pain, they're really in the pit at the moment. Their pain is overwhelming. It's roaring at them. They're stuck. And yet, God was able to, just for a moment, lift them out of that pit, help them see, broaden their horizons, and join in with Jade as she celebrated the greatness of God in her life. Yigdal Yahweh, people. How can you use God's kindness towards you to encourage those this week who really need it? Or more to the point, if it's you who's in the pit, and the noise in your head won't stop. And you feel life actually sucking you further in. How are you going to broaden your horizon so that you can declare Yigdal Yahweh? Well, of course, it's remembering what Jesus has done for you. But it's also remembering what he has done for those around you. And possibly even what he's done for you in your past. The way that he continues to lift us out of that pit and save us even from ourselves. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you that even though David's life was horrible at times, you delivered him and he could declare your praises. Thank you for the way that not only he benefited from these experiences, but the people of God benefited. Thank you for the way that he was their pathway to true, lasting happiness that sure knowledge that you are on their side and you are good to them. Thank you that we see that same work in Jesus, the one who suffered for us, whose suffering brings us peace. And Lord, I particularly pray for those this morning that feel like they're stuck in that place. We pray that part of your goodness to them could be the people around them as we share how you have delivered us from tough situations. And of course, Lord, we do look forward to that moment where that will be the normal experience of the people of God, where we will forever sing that new song, celebrating the way that there will never again be those pits and those moments. And we look forward to that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Dave. It's really cool how God sort of, we've got the psalm.